You truly are blessed to have such a wonderful praise team. Thank you guys for blessing us this morning. I also want to echo Lincoln's words of what a fantastic day yesterday was. And I was talking with Mark Thompson. He said, uh, really, the people that were blessed were those that were able to go and buy the groceries and hear the stories of the people we were serving. So fantastic job by Mike Vincent and all involved. Imagine, if you will, that you're on one of the small commuter flights you know, one of the puddle jumpers that's not too big, and you're flying back into Huntsville uh, later in the evening, and your plane that you're on starts going through a tremendous storm. And the, the pilot comes over the intercom, and he says, we're, we're going to try to climb to a higher altitude to see if we can get a little bit uh, smoother trip for you folks. But as he climbs up, the, the storm just intensifies. And so as the lights start kind of flickering a little bit, the steward is yelling at the one guy that's trying to make his way back to the bathroom, please get in your seat, stay buckled up, this is a rough one. And so the, the plane is being tossed from left to right and up and down, and you're wondering how long the plane's going to be able to go through such rough storm. And then the pilot returns on the intercom, and he informs those on board that they're going through some type of mechanical difficulty. And just to be on the safe side, uh, we're not going to continue this flight, and we're looking for a place to land. And so you realize how serious the situation is, and you start thinking, what if I never get to talk with my loved ones again? Those I'm closest to, those I care about the most, what if this is it? And so just to be on the safe side, you pull a pen out from your jacket or your purse, and you're frantically looking for something, you remember there's a white air sac bag in front of you. So you pull that out, and you start jotting down things. Well, outside of expressions of love, what do you write? Honey, just in case you forgot, this is the, the combination to the set. Uh, or this is where I've got a policy over here, don't forget. That. Or do you write things of utmost importance? Do you talk about the things that are central to you to make sure that your son and, and daughter truly get this one last time? This was most important to me. What are some of those thoughts that you write down? Well, although the setting was different, the urgency of the moment was remarkably similar. The Apostle Peter found himself incarcerated on the eve of his execution. And I imagine as the guard brought the requested parchment and writing utensil, that, that Peter knew that he was pinning his final chapter in his life. The final things that he would share with those that he would leave behind. And I'm wondering as, as he's composing his thoughts, saying, what's it going to be? How do I sum this up? What's the one last thing I need to share with these brothers and sisters in Christ? I wonder if echoing in the back of his mind, he starts thinking about his calling. The calling he received from Jesus on the night of his arrest. Luke chapter 22 and verse 32, he says, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, even though Jesus knew that he would stumble and he would fall. But he didn't want that denial to define him. So he adds, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. That's his calling. He says, I know you're going to fail, and I'm not going to hold against you, but here's your calling. Here's what I want you to do from this point forward. I want you to strengthen your brothers. It's interesting that the verb sterigmos, to strengthen, is only used here at, at this point in, in Scripture. Now, the noun version of this same word is used by Peter in his final word that he gives to his brothers and sisters in Christ. And it was a word used outside of Scriptures by astronomers when they were, or were trying to gain their bearing by looking at the fixed positions in the stars. It says, here's where your secure position is. And so what Peter is trying to say is, that's what we need. And not looking to the stars. We need to look to Jesus Christ to gain our bearing to gain our footing, to remain firm in who we are as a people, to gain a secure position. We'll see that at the final verse in this wonderful letter. Well, why did they need to hold firm? Well, in reality, there's some teachings that are working their way in and are being spread among the brothers and, and sisters in Christ. And so he's talking about these false teachers and these enlightened people were doing their best to diminish the authority of Scripture, the importance of Christ, and, and therefore Christ-like behavior. Sure, I'm glad we don't wrestle with those same temptations today. 
But instead, these enlightened folks were professing a new kind of freedom, especially in the realm of sensual behavior. Well, how does this happen? Because if we can figure out how it worked its way into the church back in the first century, hopefully we can gain a secure footing for us. Well, though these leaders had a knowledge of God, Scripture says that they hadn't been born again. That, that though they had a knowledge of God, it hadn't taken hold. And so they hadn't begun the regeneration process. And so in reality, they had a knowledge, but these men had never been changed. So what they do? They begin leading people back into their old ways, step back into some of their old sins and the ways of the world. So sound doctrine and sound morality, what's on the chopping block? And Peter knows this. He says, we've got to get back to what's most important. So in this final letter, he lays out two priorities that he has for the believers. Number one is that, they, uh, that the letter's recipients would be reminded of their foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. He's like, everything has to go back to that or we have nothing. But the second thing he says is, not only do we need to recapture what's most important, we need to add to our faith. It's not enough to say, well, I I believe. I have a faith. He says, no, you need to add to that and continue growing in your relationship. You must begin incorporating and, and increase your faith into the different aspects of your life. So in this final plea, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, the final thing that he would write, is grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, in this sermon series, with ever-increasing glory, we've talked about this kind of discipleship journey, this climb as you will. And we've looked at some of Barna's research about those that at first are struggling in their faith. And though we spent some time talking about those that haven't made a faith commitment, the majority of our time is with those that have been convicted those that have made a decision to follow after Christ, that made a commitment to the church. But we also talked about over a period of time that some that go through this commitment phase and and are getting involved in lives of the church aren't seeing the transformation that they see recorded in Scripture. So you go through a period of discontentment. Some do. And that can be a good thing if it's driven by God. Maybe we need to go through a period of brokenness. We go back and say, you know what? It's hard for me to truly appreciate the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ and the grace that comes from God until we really get an understanding of what our sin is in our life and be broken that we haven't completely turned ourselves over to Him. And so through a process of surrendering, then we get to the final two steps, which is intimacy in Christ, which is what Steve talked about this morning with Moses. And finally, hope I don't fall here and Workman's comp covers it if I do. It's compassion. Once we develop an intimacy with God and allow that to totally consume us, guess what? That's going to overflow into our, our lives and our hearts. And guess what? Uh, sometimes it's difficult for us to truly serve others and to love people that are not like us because we're trying to do it under our own power and it doesn't work. We have to allow it to be an overflow from what God is doing in our lives. How do we get there? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to our text from this morning, which is 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. So I want us to dig into this. And after the apostle introduces himself, Peter's going to address the recipients of this letter. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. To those through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be, you, be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Well, in reality, I mean, this is a, a nice cordial greeting, but it's loaded. I mean, it is some heavy stuff. Because he wants to lay out exactly who Jesus is. If there are false teachers within the church, they're trying to diminish the importance of Jesus. He says, let's get that on, on the table. Before we start talking about growing in our relationship with God, we've got to determine who Jesus is. The first attribute that he says is he's God. He is God. He's completely God and he's completely man. So he is a supreme deity. Okay, so that's who he is. He's full deity. The second thing he says is he's our Savior. 
He's the author of salvation. And Peter will talk about he's the author of salvation in the past. And you guys, when, when you give your life as, as these three did this morning, we know that our sins have been washed away in the past. But he's also the author of salvation right now. And he allows his grace to continue on in our life. And he's also going to be the author of our salvation in the future, on the day of judgment. He is the one that stands there. So he said he is our Savior. Well, the next thing he calls him is the Christ. He's the anointed one, the Messiah promised from old, the one that they have been waiting for. And finally, he calls him Lord, someone that can, can command respect and can command that we follow after his lordship, but that Jesus was there from the present. John talks about he was there as they were laying out the foundations of the earth. He's Lord. He is Lord all the way through Israel's history. He's their covenant God. Says, Lord, he claims the right to our obedience. So Jesus is all these things. He says, once we have that established and we know who Jesus is, then we have a better understanding of the knowledge of him. And we grow in the grace and peace. Now, knowledge is kind of a key word in this epistle. Peter employs the Greek term gnosis in verse 5. We'll get to that in just a moment. Well, that's knowledge. That's book knowledge. And if you're struggling with understanding who God is and different aspects of him, well, we got some fantastic classes in our ABFs and, and Jesse and, and Shelby down in the youth department and Amy and her fantastic crew with our children. We're growing in that knowledge. That's book knowledge. It's an understanding that we get from Scripture, okay, and, and from mature believers, all right? But he also, here in this point, in this verse, later in the letter, he, the apostle's going to use epinosis, okay? And it's a term used to describe a fuller and deeper understanding and an intimacy with God. He's not talking about book knowledge. We within churches of Christ have been called a people of the book, and that's fantastic as long as we know about God and our understanding is based in what we see in Scripture. That's fantastic. But what he's talking about here is something deeper, something richer. It's a knowledge of God and a knowledge that God begins to have of us. And it's an intimate relationship, much like a husband and wife, that grow as the, as the relationship goes over a period of time. Well, let's read exactly what he's talking about. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and his goodness. What Peter is talking about here is we have access to a power. We have access to the power that's not of us, that comes from God. It's the Holy Spirit that has this power within us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So guess what he's saying? We have enough to keep growing in our faith. And if we are not growing, if we're not maturing, if we're stagnating, it's not that there's not a power available to us, it's that we're not tapped into that power. We're not accessing it. What does Paul say? We can do all things through Christ who strengthened. So if we're not doing it, it's not because of a lack of a supply. Our knowledge of God, this relationship, as it builds, it strengthens. Like a husband-wife relationship, as you go through ups and downs together, it's no longer like you're dating. You're like, well, does she like me? Does she not? Well, it's a coming together. It's a mutual sharing of a relationship. And as we go through that, and our knowledge of God increases, man, so does our ability to tap into God's goodness and his power from his spirit. Let's read in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. What Peter is saying here is we need to take inventory. There's a lot of things that have been promised to us throughout all of history for God's people. And we need to see what those are. We know that God has promised us a lot of things. And John 14 and verse 23 says, if we will believe in God, if we'll have faith in him, if we'll be obedient to what he's calling us to, he will indwell us. He will send us his Holy Spirit. And when we allow the Spirit to guide us and help us, we can't help become more Christ-like. That's something we all want to do. But you have to desire this participation 
and the divine more than we desire anything else in this world. Because if we're running after something else, we don't have enough strength, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough passion to go after God. They have to be the most important thing in our life. What do we do if those that that aren't running after this? In chapter 2, Paul describes the false teachers as those who are unwilling to submit to God's authority. It's someone that says, well, I have a knowledge of God, but you know what, I, I really want to diminish what Scripture says because it doesn't really line up with where I am. It, it's kind of Christ's light. I, I just want to kind of take a little bit of it, and, you know, we get together at Christmas, we're going to do uh, Santa, but we're also going to, and Rudolph, but we're also going to mix in a little baby Jesus in there, and we're, we're going to go and pursue everything that we want in this world, but we're going to kind of a Christian slant on it. It's not going to be the most important thing, but it's a portion of who we are. It's a slice. It's what makes us a little bit different than the people in the world. What does Peter say about those that aren't pursuing God with everything? He said it reminds me of a dog whose stomach's upset. He goes to start eating some grass, and then he kind of yaks up his dinner, and it's there, and the dog is like, oh, man, that was terrible. Goes, and he lays down, and he gets to feel a little bit better, and instead of going over to his food dish, he goes back to hear and starts eating what he's thrown up earlier. He said, that's how repulsive it is when we pursue God half-heartedly. When we just kind of mix in a little bit, when we're not really interested in total transformation, we just kind of want to have some good feelings. It's kind of the social thing to do, to go to a church. And Where do you go to? Oh, well, I go here. Oh, well, I go here. Oh, great. No, he said, you've got to pursue God with everything. That's what he's calling us to. Okay, well, up to this point, it's been kind of vague. Uh, Some of the stuff we've been talking about, seeking after God's glory. Okay, how am I going to do that tomorrow morning? I'm going to go to work or go to school. How do I participate in this divine nature of Jesus? The way home from church, I'm not sure. Uh, What about this whole indwelling of the Spirit? How do you know if it's there? Man, it, it might be easier to nail jello to the wall than to try to get some of these concepts here. And what Peter would tell you is, I'm right there with you. Peter even says, when I'm reading some of Paul's stuff, I don't get it. It's a little too difficult for me. And so Peter said, I used to be a fisherman. Let me give you some tangible things. And so he lays in and says, let's make this thing practical. Let's read in 2 Peter 1 and verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. What's he talking about in goodness You remember Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. He says it has to start here with your mind. You have to start thinking about good things. You have to talk about things that are right, things that are pure, things that are noble, things that are encouraging, things that really draw us into the presence of Jesus, things that are admirable. He said when we start concentrating on these things, it starts to transform our mind. Okay? And so that then begins to overflow in our speech and in our conduct and everything else. Unfortunately, sometimes we try to push the envelope on things that we're watching on TV and movies. And, you know, sometimes, oh, I'm, I'm nice to most people, but I'm still harboring some ill feelings towards this brother. In fact, he's sitting over here on this pew, and I wish he'd move back a few times. I don't have to see him when I'm praising God. And so we, we have these things we hold in there. And then we're also running after the things that our neighbors next door to. We, we, we want God, but we also want to run after the things of this world. Goodness will not be the natural overflow of our lives as long as we're compromising what we're thinking about. The next is knowledge, and we talked about this word for understanding. But it's a knowledge of God that's laid out in Scripture. Acts chapter 17, what does Luke say? He said the the Bereans were more noble because they went in, and when Paul and Silas were presenting the gospel message, he said they went back, and they said, let's take what they've said and see how that matches up with Scripture. They're making an investment in their faith. I encourage you to do the same thing. 2 Peter 1 and verse 6 continued this idea. He said, into knowledge, self-control. Into self-control, perseverance. Into perseverance, godliness. Okay? What about self-control? This is the idea of mastering one's moods, mastering one's desires, mastering one's passions 
instead of allowing these things to master us. We have two dogs at our house. One is Winston, our golden retriever that you've heard me talk about. I mean, he truly is Doug from the movie Up. I mean, he's just happy-go-lucky, loyal as the day is long. We'll let him out. He'll go do his thing. And if we walk inside, sometimes he'll just sit by the back porch instead of roaming the neighborhood. He just loves us, loves to be with us. I'm Winston. And, and he's a good dog. And then a little over a year ago, we added Toby. Uh, Toby is a dog that was... Jill was told was a teacup variety. He's about 25 pounds. It doesn't really fit in the teacup variety. But Jill bought him out of a trunk from a lady at Toys R Us, so what do you expect? But Toby is, is to- I'm serious about that. Uh, w- w- what's different about Toby is he's kind of the polar opposite of Winston. Um, if you give him free reign, he's gone. Um, and we had to put a little sign on him, please return. I didn't want to do that. And I'm like, no, just let him go. But, you know, so they'll call us. Well, Toby's gone out. And so we had to make some adjustments. One dog is allowed to walk wherever he'd like around. He even gets to go across the street and swim in the ponds. He does that all the time, and he comes back, and we just whistle, and he comes. The other dog wears this uh, shocker collar that's actually designed for a much larger dog and we turn it up on high. And I have to tell you, when it starts beeping and it goes off, I kind of chuckle. I, I like that. For those that are friends of Farside, um, Toby is going to the vet to be tutored this week. So hopefully that will help as well. So, Well, in addition to self-control, we're not dogs. We are someone that can control our actions. We are to add perseverance. And if we add and, and think about this, what are we persevering through? And we go through trials, we go through hardships, we go through experiences, and we're like, God, where are you in this? But if we truly believe that God uses everything to build us up, to encourage us, that trials are a blessing, we have to think, if I'm going through this, God's got something important for me, amen? There's something in the kingdom He needs me to do, so He's sharpening me to be a more effective tool if we start seeing that, we have more perseverance and we're, we're not going to allow discouragement and, and despair to lead us to walk away because God is in control. Amen? We persevere. And to this, he adds godliness. Now, sometimes you, you get kind of, ooh, I don't know if I can be godly. But what he's talking about here is not perfection, but rather a continual awareness of God's presence in all aspects of our lives. So it, I've talked about this in the past. It's an ongoing dialogue we start in the morning. Lord, please be with me. Abide with me. Go with me as I go throughout this day and guide my steps. Lord, if there's someone that I haven't met that comes into my presence, let me know if there's something I need to be doing. What would Jesus do in this situation as you walk into a crisis or as the, the, it appears your world is coming unraveled? Lord, help me through this. So it's an ongoing uh, dialogue with God. And so... God is there with us and allows us to be in his presence. And we start experiencing a sense of godliness in our lives. 2 Peter 1 and verse 7 continues this. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. And what's he going after here? Brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. In John 1, in John 4 and verse 20, he says, Some of you folks feel like that this relationship with God, that, boy, I have this intimacy with God. Don't so much like brother so-and-so, but, boy, me and God are great. He said, if you're focusing in on your intimacy with God, but you can't get along with your brothers, he said, that relationship, that good feeling you got between you and God, he says, a lie. He discounts what you have with God if you can't maintain godly relationships and brotherly kindness with those that are right next to you. So we're called to support, we're called to encourage, we're called to challenge one another. And it's not just for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but all for, also for those outside. Because I can't tell you how many times the gospel message has been discounted because of what's going on down at the church house. Amen? Why would someone want to be a part? And then why should we call them into our community if the community is no different than what we see in the world? Brotherly kindness is crucial. Finally, he calls us to love. To love as God loved us. 
And not just for our brothers and sisters we get along with, but for those we come in contact with. And sometimes this is a costly love. It's something that we give of ourselves as God gave to us. Why is this so important that we grow in these attitudes and actions? 2 Peter 1 and verse 8 tells us, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a scary thought. To think that I've been convicted, I've heard the story of Jesus Oh, I believe it, but we're not doing anything with it. Oh, I've been baptized. My sins have been washed away, but I'm just going to park it here. He says, no, you've got to add to it. You've got to continue growing in who you are. It's not just enough that you've been saved. No, you've got to put yourself under the lordship of God because otherwise we become unproductive. He takes it a step further in the next verse in verse 9. He says, it's almost as if looking at your lives you forgot about this whole forgiveness thing. It's almost as if you're discounting what Jesus did on the cross based on how you're living it out. You're just like, well, I'm just kind of who I am. So this becomes the final message, the final thing that he would talk about. He's encouraging people in this last message. He gives them a prescription for spiritual growth and effectiveness. What am I asking of us? What am I asking of myself? Keep climbing. Keep growing. Keep seeking after the person God would have you to be. Not too long ago, I was hanging out with a friend of mine named Tony. Tony's a great guy. I think he loves the Lord. He's just a little rough around the edges, so to speak. And he and I were hanging out, and there was he had uh, his radio blaring on the classic rock station, and there was the old Leonard Skinner song, Free Bird, on there. And we're just kind of sitting there talking, and it got right to the line, right before the, the big guitar solo, for those of you who are classic rock fans. And it, there's a line there that says, Lord knows I can't change. You know, so he, he says, I can't change. Well, Tony clipped off our conversation. He said, that's me. He goes, I'm the free bird. I said, what do you mean, Tony? He says, the Lord knows I can't change. I am who I am. Take me or leave me because I can't change. In reality, what Tony was saying is, I like who I am, and I'm not going to change. If you don't like it, tough. This is who I am. Kim was a mom of one of our teens in Houston. During the seven years when Jill and I were doing youth ministry down there, Kim was always on some different type of diet plan. And she would lose five or ten pounds, and she'd have little celebrations, but then she'd gain it right back. And she'd always walk around with a Diet Coke in her hand. And I, we, we knew she was trying. She always talked about her weight. Then one time, we started noticing that the weight just started dropping. And over a series of months, she lost between 40 and 50 pounds. Well, I waited to see, and this is a dramatic weight loss, and I waited to see if she put it back on, and she didn't. And one night, we had a bunch of teenagers over at her house as they were singing and getting ready for the devotional time. I saw her in the kitchen cleaning up, and I went and I said, Kim, what are you doing? Are you on South Beach? Uh, you know, are you on Weight Watchers, Atkins? What, what is it? She goes, no. I said, well, then how are you losing weight? And she said, well, she said, I'm, I'm eating less, and, and I'm doing more exercise. I was like, well, well, yeah. How are you staying with it? And she said, well, I really came to the point in the realization that no food tastes as good as being healthy and feeling good and looking right. And I got to thinking, that's us. Until we get to the point where no sin feels as good as being in the presence of our Heavenly Father, we're never going to get there. We just won't. That has to be the desire. God's there. He's got the power. He's given us a roadmap. The only missing ingredient is our desire. Are we going to do it, folks? Are we going to take that step forward? Are, are you like Kim? Have you gotten to the point where you're like, this is no longer satisfying running after the things of the world. Solomon says, I'm done. Are, are you there? Are you still with Tony saying, I don't care if I've been leveled off for years. This is who I am, and I hope by the grace of God I'll squeak into heaven. 
man, God's calling you to so much more, not just to live out your days, but to live out your days in His presence and allow that community that we have with Him to overflow into the lives of those we interact with. One more point to bless you with. All right, get, get, get your Bibles out. Keep, keep your finger here. But go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. This really hit me in a new way this week. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, now can been... Okay, it keeps going. Go back to 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. Who's the author of this text? Simon Peter, the servant of the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who the righteousness. Why did he, on his final letter, bring back his old Hebrew name? No one had called him Simon in close to 30 years. Why would he do this? And why in the in first book, first letter did he not? My personal opinion is the first book is about salvation. It is confirming what we have in Jesus Christ and what it means to be partnered with Him. The second letter is about sanctification. It's about changing. It's about growing. It's about maturing in who we are in Christ. And he says, some of you don't know who I was. You just see the great and grandfatherly Apostle Peter, the one that spoke at, at Pentecost, the one that delivered the final message that, yes, the Gentiles are now within the church. You're the one that has seen me travel all over and set up these churches. I want you to remember who I was before God got a hold of me. My old, unredeemed life. I was Simon, but now I'm Peter. Jesus gave me this name when I didn't deserve it, when I was not a rock, when I was not the, the, the person to lead the church and be a foundation. He says, I've finally grown into this. I finally got it. I finally have let everything else go to become the person that God wants me to be, to claim the identity that was given to me then. I've now grown into it, but don't forget I was Simon. And if you're still living as Simon, please... Don't forget, God has the power to change us into Peter. This is what he's calling each of us to do. To continue our growth day by day, step by step, to draw us closer to him with ever-increasing glory. Peter says, until the day when we're welcome home and take one more step into his glory, into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we're still wearing the name of Simon. Lord, help us to claim the privilege and claim the name and the identity that you've given us as heirs in the kingdom. Lord, help us to seek after that instead of the, the things of this world that are just unfulfilling. Lord, help us to crave you and wanting to be in your presence and develop that wholesome relationship with you. Lord, this transforming. As we read about Moses earlier, Lord, you carved out a place in the rock so that he could be close to you. And just see a portion of your glory. Do that for us, Lord. Carve us a place. Help us to desire to be there, to talk with you as a friend. Not to our glory, but Lord, so that your radiance can shine off of us into a world that desperately needs your light shining in it. Lord, help us to do this. Helps me more like your son Jesus. His name we pray. Amen.